Hello, YouTubers, friends, compatriots, bootlicker shills, debt slayers, peasants, vassals, minions, meat sacks, global citizens. I'm useful idiot. Welcome. Let's go global again. And this is my third in a, what's probably going to be a four or five part series uh, related to the idea of corporate, uh, global corporate governance, uh, or what a lot of people used to call the New World Order. Uh, it goes by many names, uh, including the Deep State, which I'll be doing another video on. Uh, this one's going to be on uh, an historical precedent uh, that we have called Atlantica, or a, uh, uh, Atlantic Union. And this is the uh, uh, idea of uh, creating a federation, a combined country of uh, Europe and the United States. And it was uh, far more popular than a lot of people would think. And the whole idea of, of, of globalists, globalists and internationalists uh, certainly is nothing new. It's been around for a long time and goes back to uh, people like Cecil Rhodes, who had a lot to do with uh, setting up the blueprint for imperialism in the, in the 19th century, as well as the early 20th century. And uh, so the, these ideas have been around for a long time, and uh, one of the reasons why um, communism was viewed as an internationalist movement at one point. And uh, the, these are uh, all uh, ideas that converge uh, together to this idea of a one world government. And uh, this one about Atlantica is, is probably one of the more fascinating ones. Uh, in the post World War II era, uh, there was a proposed uh, giant Atlantic Federation and they were going to use the foundations of NATO to do it. And I brought this up in the uh, um, video I did on all the trade agreements going on with the United States right now in the world uh, where um, potentially they could uh, essentially use the NATO uh, and UN uh, military apparatus and infrastructure to integrate with the trade agreements to, uh, to set up this uh, corporate world, uh, global uh, corporate governance. And uh, so in the World War II era, uh, they essentially had the same thought. Uh, so this is back in 1939, and a lot of this uh, idea was spurred by a, a book published back then by Clarence Streit uh, called Union Now, and uh, I will definitely be picking up a copy of that book as soon as possible. But it envisioned a, a, a federation of uh, America, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, South Africa, and Western Europe uh, to, f to, quote, fight totalitarianism, unquote, which certainly was on the rise in, in 1939. But uh, interesting to look at that list of nations because if you take South Africa, of course, no, are notoriously part of BRICS now, uh, the, joining those uh, five entities uh, talks about uh, or direct, directly relates to the fact that we have the Five Eyes nations now, which is America, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, and Great Britain, uh, who have a, a surveillance state and, uh, and in some respects are somewhat of a federation already. Um, and it also relates to Bretton Woods, all the same countries involved in setting up the new economic order. Uh, and this is all happening at the same time in the post-war period. And the roots of the ideas uh, for the Eurozone were also uh, hatched uh, during and developed uh, during this whole period. This talk about this uh, uh, um, Atlantic uh, Union, this Atlantic Federation, this place called Atlantica. And uh, the, the real surprise was finding out that there's congressional records uh, in the United States from the 1940s to the 1970s where there was uh, lots of uh, resolutions and hearings uh, in favor of an Atlantic Union. So there's been a lot of internationalists and globalists uh, operating our government and governments around the world for quite some time. And in fact, in 1971, there was a Foreign Affairs Committee hearing uh, that was proposing to combine the United States and Western Europe into one country. And this was only uh, as far back as 1971. And it would be a federal system with all the nations uh, brought in as states uh, with one currency, one military, one commerce system, one foreign policy. So uh, we're certainly a long way off from that, but certainly also aligns with a lot of the goals that we hear from the UN, uh, from NATO, and, and ideas uh, professed by corporations and, and certainly these trade agreements. And uh, in, between, uh, in the 1950s and 1970s, there was hundreds of legislators uh, in the U.S. who supported the idea. And, uh, there were sim similar hearings uh, from the one in 71 uh, in 1960, in 1966, and 1968, all uh, with the idea of creating this Atlantic Union or the United States and Western U Europe either into one country or uh, a federation. And uh, as, as we know, of course, uh, originally this whole idea of 
of this uh, Atlantic Union was to fight totalitarianism, and then and they just ad adapted it in the 50s in the post-war period uh, as a ne necessity to, to, to fight the communists and the Soviet Union. And uh, coincidentally, at the same time, all this uh, idea of an Atlantic Union was being discussed was the same period uh, that gave us uh, the IMF and World Bank that were created in 1944 with uh, Maynard Keynes uh, uh, setting that up. So we're getting a lot of explanation for why we live in a Keynesian world now and we still use those techniques because uh, it certainly uh, aids the globalists and um, Keynes was a, a, a architect for that and uh, it's one of the dominant themes in our a global corporate world that we live in now. Uh, and then 1947, the GATT or General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade was created and that's a, an early version, an early blueprint of a, of a global system that we're seeing advanced even further with these uh, trade agreements that the United States is trying to set up. And then of course the UN uh, was created around that same time and then the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, once again the organization to centralize and uh, try and, and harmonize uh, the economies around the globe. And so we see these rudimentary examples of uh, organizations we see blossoming in our, our modern world, and certainly in the 21st century, to uh, address all these issues of globalization and integration of all nations into a, a global network. Um, I found it uh, uh, interesting to look at the cast of characters, too, uh, going through the, this information. Ronald Reagan and Lyndon Johnson. Uh, a Republican and a Democrat were both against this and it was uh, obviously being discussed at the time uh, they were president but uh, Nixon uh, in 1966 he supported the Atlantic uh, Union resolution uh, long before he became president and uh, Eisenhower thought it was inevitable and no surprise that uh, Eisenhower wa would warn us about uh, the people that were behind uh, this movement and uh, Bobby Kennedy, George McGovern and Barry Goldwater were also all uh, supporters of this Atlantic Union. So a lot of surprising uh, uh, internationalists and globalists out there. And uh, the plot for World War uh, One World Government uh, uh, basically became anti-communism. And um, and ironically, the uh, debacle in Vietnam was when all the uh, discussion of this Atlantic Union seemed to dissolve. And not soon after that, of course, the United States went off the gold standard. So Events uh, changed rapidly, and all of a sudden, it didn't sound so good for the whole world to be united, or at least the timing wasn't good. And uh, I, I do have to say that uh, I like the fact that Thomas Friedman and Larry Summers, uh, who have uh, interest in, in the global system, and, and they're certainly uh, uh, proponents of it, are two that realize that at some point China has to be integrated into this global system. And so the idea of a uh, Atlantic uh, Union and the Federation doesn't make as much sense anymore because they want to, uh, as we have a pivot to Asia going on right now by the United States, uh, we want to integrate uh, China into that system. And, uh, and by everything I observed, uh, this is happening. And, uh, and that was, so another thing we see is that all, all this talk about this union also led up to uh, other trade deals, including NAFTA. And NAFTA was one layer of, of corporate governance. And uh, these new trade agreements, the TPP, the TTIP and the TTISA are all uh, another uh, much larger uh, layer of corporate governance uh, on top of uh, what NAFTA was. And we, we've already seen a lot of the bad results from NAFTA, so we can expect that uh, exponentially with the passage of these new trade agreements. And uh, another thing that is relevant to this whole Atlantic Union, of course, is we have the Basel Accords and a uh, uh, those are also a, a symptom now that grew out of this globalization, these globalization efforts and this global uh, uh, corporate governance model. Uh, the battle accords are going to standardize uh, banking uh, across the globe and try and uh, make the whole system homogenous. And uh, oddly enough, right now, even Iran is uh, talking about uh, 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 making sure that it operates within the accords of uh, the Basel Accords. So, um, definitely a, a global. Uh, thing that has to be uh, addressed. And then the uh, central banks acting together globally. That's another part of this uh, globalization that's already in place. When you have the Federal Reserve and the, the uh, Central Bank of Europe uh, acting in, in, in tandem, and uh, particularly the United States uh, Federal Reserve uh, bailing out and giving all these uh, loans and loan guarantees and bailouts and uh, paying uh, uh, interest on reserves, 
at the U.S. Uh, Central Bank uh, seems like a pretty uh, interesting relationship and uh, one that speaks of the fact that for all practical purposes uh, an Atlantic Union uh, has been made and, and we are somewhat federalized but uh, certainly events in the Eurozone right now are uh, complicating uh, that vision but uh, there you have it, a peek at uh, Ant Atlantica, a uh, new world order that uh, never was but maybe will be just in another name and a, another form. I'm a useful idiot, don't you be one too?